Well, that drought monitor continues to expand and the forecast, at least from what I could see, doesn't look very conducive to bringing precipitation to dry areas of the Midwest and the plains here as we near the end of October and the end of harvest. So let's talk about it. Joining us now mm -hmm. as we look at weather, Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Eric, thanks for being with us. Hope you had a great weekend. And uh, man, oh man, I, I look at that drought monitor continuing to expand not much on the radar early in the week uh, it just more of the same i mean it's a wide open window for harvest but it's not helping the soil moisture any is it eric no and I, you're right i mean drought monitor for the lower 48 is not 78 percent so we've got 70 percent of the country covered in some form of drought so that also includes the d0 category we're about 45 percent in d1 uh, to d4 but, uh, you know, for most of us, it's been weeks, if not, you know, we could be approaching two months in some areas that haven't measured, you know, decent precipitation. And about the only game in town was a little cutoff low that set over, you know, Colorado over the weekend. Yeah, packed some snow into the central Rockies. There was some flooding in parts of New Mexico. I'm sure you may saw that on the news today. But that low is going to try to move all the way to Illinois in the next two days. And it's going to be so stark for moisture, maybe some isolated showers and storms to its south and east but they might be enough just to knock the dust out of the air and then it gets, you know, dry again after that. About, um, you know, the, the, the only thing I see on the horizon is it's pretty normal that right around Halloween, we get something big coming through. Um, I think it's just there to kind of ruin the kids, you know, I know. <laughs> but there's, there's, a, there's a system finally. So Jesse, the problem has been this. If you want to have an active weather pattern in fall, where we don't see the Mississippi River drop back down to nine feet below low stage outside of Memphis, which is as it is today, where we don't have, you know, 28 states in the lower 48 that have some significant portion that are, you know, in the lowest two percentile on soil moisture down to 16 inches. You know, if you want to get into a situation where we've got flow so you can do better fall application after harvest, you've got to get the jet stream level winds to come out of the southwest. And they haven't. They've been either tucked away in Canada or they've been coming out of the Northwest. And there's only one time a year where Northwest jet stream flow is good for moisture in the Midwest. And that's July, you know, well, late June through July and early August, that that six week stretch. So the problem has been it's big ridges over the Southwest where it's had record heat. Um, and while we've had a little bit of colder air dipping at times, it's been very mild. Uh, and we're just going to stay that way for a while. So when does it break? Well, I, I really think around, you know, two or three days before Halloween, we're going to flip it all around. We're going to get some southwest flow. We're going to get something that could kick off a storm system to bring some moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico and uh, finally bring some, you know, a little bit of moisture. But this will not undo a drought. It just won't. If it took us 60 days to get into this drought, I mean, to be honest with you, without major flooding, you have to take twice that amount of time to get out of it. We, we need 120 days of consistent rainfall to erase this. And the thing is we're going in toward winter. So while I could tell you November looks good, it looks like it's gonna be above average moisture for a big section of the central United States. I've got lots of reasons to think that it's gonna be that way. Not, not every day, not every day's wet, but just not like October. Um, you know, we, we honestly need to have a, we need to have a pretty nasty winter in order to break this drought before next spring. Well, and thinking about that, heading a little bit longer range, you know, mentioned a, a slight pattern shift potential here at the end of the month, but then through November, think about December, January into next spring. I mean, I know it's hard to forecast out that far, but anything new on, on models that you're seeing longer range that you want to at least keep an eye on here, Eric? Yeah, I mean, it's hard, nearly impossible. We're going to do it anyway. Like, that's that's what we do, right? So <laughs> it just, it's just to make sure that everyone knows that, you know, it's, it's very speculative. Um, so so here's the big ideas, right? Um, uh, right now, when I look upstream, so that would be the Pacific Ocean, I see, I see three things. We've been able to get really cold water in the Bering Sea and up in the Gulf of Alaska. Okay, that broke a summer pattern. There's a whole lot of extremely warm water coming off of Japan. So there's this contrast in the North Pacific. And we might look at that as kind of the breeding ground for sending systems toward, you know, the West Coast of North America. And we also have a La Nina. And the La Nina says make that North Pacific jet more variable. And if it's more variable, that means it does more of this than that, you know, straight across. So it's, it's bouncing around more. Okay, we like that. That gives us better chances of cold air. That gives us better chances of storm systems that linger rather than race across the country. That overall is a pretty good signal if you're in the central United States, especially over toward the Ohio River Valley for winter. All right, so La Nina, is it 
legit. Not not yet. I mean, it's there. You know, I've been talking about it for months, but it's not a dominating kind of superpower of weather systems just yet. So it's not fully in control. I think other things like the shifting around of the MJO and that North Pacific Ocean temperature pattern are helping. And then there's stuff going on the North Atlantic as well. So that's all of my nerd speak to tell you what I'm about to tell you next. We got a week La Nina and other things are going on, which could mean we have an early start to the winter type weather starting in the Western United States first in November, getting into the central United States late November, and then getting here in December. What tends to happen is the West goes a bit drier during week La Nina events for the second half of winter and the Midwest tends to be a bit more active. The sad part about all of this is that when the La Nina begins to fade, which it'll start doing January, February, March of next year, uh, probably closer to the beginning of that time period than the later. What tends to happen is the, the the loss of momentum in the flow of the atmosphere sometimes lingers. So I looked at all of the years when we had a weak La Nina and said, what happened the next growing season? What happened next May to August? And what happened was, is that right where the driest conditions are right now, it was dry again. Now, it's not a slam dunk. Uh, six in 10 of the years, it gets drier. So what that tells me, though, is that I've now you know, I've pushed the odds in a certain direction on the risk of drought lingering into next year. And um, you factor in how dry it's been this fall. And we've got a scenario that I don't think we can ignore the risk of next growing season being impacted by a broader area of inadequate soil moisture going into it and then relying on just in time rains during the, the, the main part of the growing season. The, al the alternative is if you want to break this drought in spring, that's what we did this past spring. And it smoked out, you know, no, that's the wrong term. It flooded out Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska. And, uh, and, and that's what it takes to break a drought. So droughts never break gently. So I hope that it breaks not gently with a massive and terrible winter so that I'm not worried about next May. If it doesn't, we're going to have to go into next May, honestly, hoping for an extremely active severe weather season because it brings moisture. And that is the wrong situation for us to be in if we're going to try to look at you know, a, a really good sized crop next year for the midsection of the country. So Jesse, this is what's been sitting on my mind now for a while. I've kind of mentioned it to you in bits and pieces, but it's looking at that historical analysis that's got me most concerned. And uh, until I see some evidence to overturn that, you know, that's my current thought process. All right. South America, we should touch on what's going on in Brazil and Argentina before we close out this week. I know that things have looked better in Brazil and Argentina. Rains have been in Brazil, of course, but I know uh, they're behind on soybean planting. What's kind of the latest you're seeing in South America, Eric? Yeah, they're really behind, especially if you compare it to last year. For example, in a big state like Mato Grosso, I think they're about 35% off where they were a year ago, but they were way ahead of average last year. Uh, what was funny was last year we had spring, excuse, well, early spring rains for them in, in September, so they planted, and then it got bone dry October, November, December. Remember that? I mean, it was record dry, and then you know, rain in January, and the crop was fine. I don't see that happening this year. I, in fact, I see that now that the monsoonal rains have started, I think they're going to be more persistent through the month of November and beyond. So they're going to continue to keep that planting pace up, but they're behind. They're behind in a big way. And that's going to, I think that'll be reflective at some point later on in how uh, grains moved around the world. And maybe we'll see another time where we react to it in the markets, but I think it's already all been played out right now. So um, where am I worried about South America? I think it could stay wet too long. In the center west growing areas come january and february they need to get that whole crop out and get safrina in you combine that with the delays and planting we we could you know it just could be something that pushes their crop counter around if you say where's their drought i'd worry about the northeast part of brazil which isn't a big producing area for the crops we typically talk about but you know it's there and i worry that argentina could go toward drier conditions despite right now not having major worry about drought at, th at this point so um I would just say, though, that the center west growing area down toward Mato Grosso do Sul, Paraná, you know, Goiás, those are huge growing areas. They're looking at likely having above average precip going forward, and that's going to be a net benefit to them in the near term. Eric, good stuff as always. Anything final you want to share or reiterate to folks today? Yeah, you know, what was interesting is if we'd had this call on Friday and you wanted to ask me about the tropics, on Friday, the National Hurricane Center, and we all agreed with them, only gave a 10% chance of a tropical depression forming uh, as this little wave approached Cuba. And then we all here on Sunday were like, oh, well, there's Hurricane Oscar. <laughs> and, and what I'm concerned about, Jesse, is that I still think that we will be talking about this hurricane season during the front half of November. 
So it's low right now, even though it's Hurricane Oscar, there's some indications that we're not done yet talking about the Caribbean or Gulf of Mexico, or even the Western Atlantic. Um, I could definitely be wrong on that, but there's some key indicators that suggest that there could still be some more tropical moisture making it into the U.S. at some point in the form of a tropical depression, tropical storm, or you know, heaven forbid, another hurricane. So I just can't ignore it until it's uh, until the signal is no longer there. So let's watch the tropics too. All right, folks can find more agweather.com, ag-wx.com, Eric Snodgrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions. Always good to talk with you. Thanks for joining us this week. Yeah, you bet.